talk is like just me telling stories of me telling out of Manjul Bhargava, and half of it is about actual math. But they're all related. So the first stuff is, well, what's the point is I'm trying to study these things called D4 cortex. So it's not, very, it's not a very accurate name because I don't actually have any mechanism to detect which subgroup it is. It's just a subgroup of D4. So I call uh, these are, so, so if the Galois group of F, this is degree four, is a subgroup of D4, and say F has small Galois group. Okay, so it's small in the sense that D4 is the third biggest possible group for that, that could be a Galois group for a fourth degree polynomial, the biggest one being the symmetric group, which is order 24. The second biggest is the alternating group, which is order 12, and this is the third biggest, and all other ones are subgroups of D4. Okay, so C4 is also possible, and the Klein group is also possible. They're both subgroups of D4. So um, what I was interested in is I want to count these things, right? So so far it's very weird in the literature that we actually don't know how many of these things there are. Uh, so there has been constructions before this time that produces infinitely many. So in fact, uh, my advisor came up with such a construction, but he didn't call it that. I don't even think he even realized that he could that all of these things were D4 cortex, but uh, it's not hard to prove. Oh, well, yeah, it's not hard to prove that all of these things are actual D4s. But how many are there, right? So this is a very shocking revelation that I had, right? So it's a hundred and something like 120 year old theorem of Hilbert that says that 100% of polynomials, if you fix a degree, then 100% of polynomials within the coefficients if you just count by, count them in a box, right? Just sort like each coefficient is at most x in absolute value, you just count all of them. You get two x plus one to the n, many polynomials. And 100% of those, as x goes to infinity, will have the full symmetric group as its Galois group. So this is a consequence of the Hilbert irreducibility theorem. And you might ask, okay, well, what's the error term? Like how many of them are actually not Sn? And it took a long time. Um, so you have an obvious lower bound for the error term, right? If you just let the first coefficient be zero, or the last, sorry, the last coefficient be zero, right? Then you're automatically reducible. You're not going to have the full symmetric group. So you have like basically big O of xn minus one, at least that many that are not going to be sn. And one might ask, is that the sharp bound? And it was only like, three years ago that big O of x to the n minus one plus epsilon was proved. Okay, so the, another question that you can ask, okay, well, are the reducible ones the bulk of the error term? That means that other than the SNs, the next biggest batch is the reducible polynomials. And I believe that the answer actually is yes, which is very surprising because you would assume that the AN polynomials, which are the polynomials with alternating group, probably are the next biggest but they're not, in fact, they're very small. <laughs> okay, so I was interested in getting a good lower bound for the number of D4 cortex, and I found something surprising. In fact, there are way more D4 cortex than one might expect. So, so this is all part of the problem of trying to count uh, binary forms of degree four that have small Galois group, okay? So one of the things is that you have to describe them, right? So here's a bad way to describe D4 cortex. You just go on, say, you just go on Sage or Magma or whatever, and then you just randomly punch in coefficients and pray that you're going to get a D4. You're not going to get a D4 very often because 0% of them are actually, by Hilbert's reducibility, and 0% of them are actually D4 polynomials. So, so you could just randomly guess. 
and uh, you just search up to some huge bound as big as you can computationally obtain and try to guess how many there are. So there, that's not a good way, right? So in fact, we, we realized it was a bad way long before there were even computers. In fact, people realize, okay, there's a way to, um, as a consequence of trying to just solve a quartic equation. Right? So we know that uh, there's a quadratic formula for solving quadratic equations. So that's very easy. You know, people learn it in like the eighth grade or something. And then there's actually a cubic equation that nobody learns, right? But it's out there. It's harder than the quadratic equation. And then there's even a quartic equation, which is even harder, and very few people even know what it is. And I don't, I'm not going to write it down here. And then there was a famous theorem of Abel that you can't do it after degree four, right? You cannot solve a general quintic or any other higher degree, okay? So how do you solve a quartic? Well, you try to reduce the problem, yeah? How many, how much board space would it take to write down the complete quartic formula? Well, it's one line, except there are like four symbols that you have to define and probably it takes another two lines to write those symbols, what would they mean? It's just ugly. It's, it is not an explicit function in terms of the coefficients because it involves taking, it involves taking a choice of roots and it has, you have to have roots of unity and things like that to even define it. So, yeah. So, you know, in modern language, the whole point of solving a polynomial, right, is you're trying to solve a group, right? You're trying to find... Like a, uh, like a normal series, right? Like different subgroups and you're trying to mod it out until you, by abelian extensions until you get down to the trivial group. And that's exactly how you solve the quartic equation, right? It's just how it actually works. So you want to reduce the quartic equation somehow down to a cubic equation. What's the natural cubic equation? It's something called the cubic resolvent, which I'm going to write down. So let's, so let's suppose we have I mean, the definition does not require anything to be integers, but of course we're always implying, implicitly assuming that we have an integer polynomial. And then we have these two things. They're called the i and j invariants. It doesn't really matter what they're an invariant of right now. All we need right now is that these are two polynomials in the coefficients of f. Okay, so you have these two polynomials in the coefficients of f, i and j. And you define the cubic resolvent to be the polynomial simply defined by x cubed minus 3i of f x plus j of f. Okay, so this is similar to the classic cubic resolvent defined for the quartic equation, or to solve the quartic equation. So you can factor, and, this, and the important thing is this is a monic polynomial. All right, so you can factor it over C. It's going to have three roots. So how do you characterize the D4 polynomials? Well, it turns out that your Galois group is going to fail to have an order, element of order three, meaning that it can't be S4, A4, and by what I said in the beginning, it has to be a subgroup of D4, if and only if the cubic resolvent is reducible over Q. So if one of the roots is rational, then you do not have any elements of order three in your Galois group. So here's a good way to characterize polynomials or binary forms with small Galois group. They're precisely the ones whose cubic resolvent is reducible. 
Now, this is a very arithmetic characterization, right? So how, how, how is that any easier than before, right? Like, it's not, not really. You have to still just guess the coefficients, compute the cube resolvent, see if reducible, and then move on. It gives you a better, more crisp criterion to check, but it doesn't give you any idea how to generate them. It doesn't give you all of them. It doesn't even give you some of them, right? Like, it's just, it's just, it's just an abstract criterion. So usually, in order to count anything, you have to do geometry, because you, geometry has volume that you can compute, and then the volume is equal to the number of points. That's how we count anything, OK? Like, why is the density of square free number 6 over pi squared? Like that, if, if, if you're just counting, like why would you get pi squared? It doesn't come out of, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, right? It has to come from some sort of geometric object. So uh, how do you associate geometry to it? I actually heard a very nice explanation by Tom Fisher two, like three months ago in, in Warwick, but I don't remember what it was. But anyway, it has something to do with like pencils of quadrics and blah, 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 and then some really weird stuff happens. But let's just define. So I don't know how to fully explain this, but somebody in the 19th century figured all this out. So let f4 of xy be the determinant of the Hessian matrix. Yeah, there's a negative one-third there for some reason. That actually tripped me up because nobody defined it like this. They just wrote down the final formula and then imply there's a negative one-third. But fundamentally, this is not nothing crazy. It's just the Hessian matrix with respect to your polynomial or your binary form F. It's going to be another quartic polynomial, right? Because you take a double derivative, you're going to get a quadratic. It's a two by two, so you're going to get two times two as your degree. It's going to be, yeah. Is this true for uh, higher degrees? Like, I mean, can you generalize this? That's yeah, you can, you can always write down the Hessian. Like, that, that's, and it doesn't even have to be a polynomial. It just has to be a C2 function. Right, but I mean, there's a nice connection, right? Between so the Hessian always results in. Like, oh, all right, I haven't used the Hessian at all. I mean, this is a definition of what a Hessian is. It's, yeah, I haven't said anything about the Hessian yet. Okay. I just wrote it down. So what's crazy is the following, which, like I said, Tom Fisher gave a nice explanation that I forgot. But if you write down this polynomial. So you pick any root, beta, right there, and you have your original form f. So this is a quartic polynomial, right? Why would it be anything? Why would you expect it to be anything except for some stupid quartic polynomial? But surprisingly, it's always the square of some quadratic polynomial. And this is extremely uncommon. If, you, if I just give you two quartics and I said, okay, there's some linear combination of them that ends up being a square, that, yeah, that doesn't happen. What you can guarantee is that you can always write it so that they have a double root. That you can control. But why would the other pair of roots also be a double root? Like that does not really happen. So this is, is, is shocking, okay? So what does that tell us? Are you assuming that beta 2 is rational here? No, no. Oh, it's, it's this is over C. Yeah. And you haven't defined QI. Yeah, it's a, it's a square root of this thing. Yeah. It's a polynomial. Yeah, it's a polynomial whose square is equal to that. OK. Here you have a given binary form of degree four, um, okay. And you can write it down in this interesting formula as a determinant of this thing. I guess. No, this this is not the same as original. This is okay. f four. Okay, so it's not the same thing. Okay. These are not the same forms. 
course not. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. Yes. Yeah, no. So just some new form, some, some other form. Produced. Yeah, so this is a covariant of the original cortic. Okay. Yeah, it's the cortic covariant, yes. Okay, so that still doesn't get us anywhere. So what? What's crazy, which I believe I discovered this, I don't think anybody before me realized that this was the case, that, okay, if you, if you take this QI and you write it out as, say, AI, let me, let me just drop the subscript, okay? So I'll just write it as AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared. So this is a quadratic form with complex coefficients. You can map it to some element in GL2C, and we're going to define it as follows. Okay? That's fine, right? You just... So this is not the normal way you write down a quadratic form, right? Because the normal way is you put the diag like these two things on the diagonal and then B and negative B on the other two sides. But write it like that, okay? And here's what's crazy. So uh, so assume that this is actually in GL2R, okay? So the complex case is not that interesting because ultimately we're interested in rational whatever. So let's assume it's in GL2R so I can write down the formula easier. It turns out that uh, f of m of xy, so m of xy is the obvious interpretation, is m is a 2 by 2 matrix, xy is a vector. And you multiply by the, or you divide by the square of the determinant this gives you back the original. Okay? So this always works, even if beta i is not even real. You just have to modify that formula appropriately. You have to twist by some complex number. But um, what if beta i is actually rational? So if your thing is actually reducible, and recall I said that this thing is a monic polynomial. So if it's rational, it actually has to be an integer. So the Hessian, I mean, I divided by three at one point. So you may not be convinced that it's actually, it actually has integer coefficients, but it does. So you, it can check that very easily. So this thing has integer coefficients. And f here has an integer coefficient. We started with an integer coefficient. And beta i has integer, is, is an integer. So this thing has integer coefficients. In fact, even after you divide by three again, it still has integer coefficients. Okay, so all this can be checked explicitly. So when you take the square root of a polynomial with integer coefficients, you have to get a polynomial which has integer coefficients, except for possibly you have to multiply by i. Okay? Yeah. So this q, it's at least proportional to something with integer coefficients. That means that, and of course in this form, you can just pull out whatever common multiple you want. So you can take this to be in GL2Q. So in other words, one can ask the question. So, oh yeah, so when, when the matrix M does this, I call, I call it uh, in the, so the set of M in GL2C that does this to F is the automorphism group of F over C. So this is a question. So if I restrict down to odd Q, so if, if I have something in the automorphism group, does that mean I can, I'm guaranteed to have a D4 quartic. So the question to this question, sorry, the answer to this question is yes, and the proof is the same. Either side means that you have this Q, and once you have this Q, you can get to the other side. Okay? So this is a very surprising fact, that you can completely characterize what really should be an arithmetic thing, right? The Galois group is very arithmetic by geometric data, like this, 
object here is geometric. Okay, so now you have a geometric criterion, you can count things because now you can do geometry and numbers. That formula looks like the change of basis for this primitive. I don't know what that is. So maybe, like, so let's see how this works in action. Okay, I gotta watch my time here, I guess. So, Let's just deal with this quartic form. And uh, just to clarify, so the M's that you're using over there, they arise from Q's over there, and you, there's three possible Q's. So technically, we're talking about three different Q automorphisms. Is that correct? Well, I'm taking one where it has a it corresponds to a rational root. It don't may, there don't, may only be one rational oh, right, root. Right, right. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. There could be yeah. three. That could happen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but it, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, so let's try this. Well, what's going on here? So we gotta compute all the pieces, right? So let's, I guess we should compute the i's first. So in this case, i of s 36, it's just that formula over there. Once you punch in all the numbers, you're gonna get that. And j of f is equal to negative 243. So that means that q f, is x cubed minus 108x minus 243, which does factor into this. Okay, so we gotta figure out what the Hessian is. So the Hessian f4, it will be negative a third. So once you take the partial derivatives, it'll be this thing. Then it will be negative 72 cubed y minus 144x squared y squared plus 27y to the 4. And uh, f4 plus 4 times negative 9f will be negative 3 2x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared squared. So yeah, up to some integer multiple, this is a perfect square. Okay. So, <clears throat> oh yeah, and uh, to check that this thing actually has D4, you could just go on magma calculator or something. Well, I mean, it's qubit resolve and it's reducible, so that already tells you that it's a subgroup of D4. But anyway. All right, so the quadratic form, Q, because we're going to ignore multiples, this gives us the following, which is, I guess, well, I'm going to do, yeah, okay, let's do it properly. So it's 2, 6, negative 4, and negative 2. But we don't care about multiples, so we can actually just divide by 2 throughout. And one can check that f of x plus 3y, negative 2x minus y, is equal to exactly 25 times f of xy. And notice that the, that the determinant of this thing is 5. So once you divide by the 25, you're going to get the original back. So what this tells you is that m is actually in the automorphism group. OK, you can, you can do this all day, right? It, it's true. So this gives you a way to capture all the d4 cortex. So now let's go to a little bit of a story, right? And so I count these things. I was pretty excited. I knew how to count these objects. And uh, in March, I, I talked to the, the Manjo Bhargava and I said, oh yeah, well, I was able to count a subfamily of binary quartic forms. 
you know, using methods inspired by your work with Arul Shankar, and he said, oh, that's great. So you, you proved that uh, the average two-summer rank of, of elliptic curves rational two torch is unbounded then. And I, no, I actually paused like that, uh, what? No idea, we, I had no idea what he was talking about. I mean, sure, I mean his, his paper with, with Shankar has something to do with elliptic curves and the summer rank, blah, blah, blah. But what, does, what I did have anything to do with that, right? I, I didn't do nothing with that. And I said, okay, but he surely just saw something immediately. Okay, I should try to do that. And then I checked very briefly at his paper. And I realized, okay, yeah, all I have to do is count quartic forms. And I count a quartic form, so yeah, I have whatever result. And I realized, wait a minute, hold on a second here. Their proof doesn't seem to follow through. So there's actually a distinction between counting binary forms because the most natural way to count binary forms is by GL2Z equivalence. Right? You, you normally wouldn't think of anything else being equivalent because there's got to be a linear map, right? Because as you, know, you know, for example, that binary forms that are, that are represent the same integers are usually GL2Z equivalent, not any other ring, right? But when you want to compute the two summer rank, you don't, like GL2Z is too fine. You got to count in a more coarse fashion. You have to, count with respect to something called, what, what I call fake PGL2Q, because it's actually not even in GL2Q, it's just some fake version of GL2Q. And even then, you're not counting the two summer elements. You have to count what's called the everywhere locally soluble orbits. And that's a very weird condition, okay? So you have to, you have to take into account all this extra information from your count from binary cortex in order to say anything about the two summer rank. So luckily for them, both of these things can be taken care of by one object, and that's the discriminant. So if the discriminant is square free, right, then the other two considerations are, are like, Frivolous, like there's, you just get back the original GL2Z orbits. So all they have to do was show that, okay, well most of the time the screw is square free, so we're good, right, easy. So I guess I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what Manjul had in mind when we told me that. And you know, I eventually realized that this was the case, so you just have to control the discriminant, you just have to control the discriminant, but it absolutely will not work the way that they envision because the discriminant, not only is it usually, not usually square free, it's never square free. Like it's that strong, it's just never square free. In fact, if you have a D4 quartic with a square free discriminant, it has to actually be reducible, <laughs> which means you don't want to count it anyway. <laughs> so the full proof is too much. So I'll just do an example. <clears throat> so by what, we, what I just showed, you can sort D4 cortex by their automorphism group, right? You can just sort, okay, the set of binary cortex that has this in their automorphism group, I call that one family. So the easiest family you can think of is this. Okay, and this corresponds to the matrix 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Okay, and the family of forms fixed by this matrix are precisely the ones that look like the following. Okay, so these are the forms, and uh, Cam wrote, wrote it down like 25 years ago. So, what is a discriminant of this thing? Well, the discriminant is, it turns out, 4i cubed minus j squared over 27. Okay, in this case, the generic i is 12a squared plus 3b squared plus c squared. And the generic j is 72 a squared C minus 9B squared C minus 54AB squared minus 2C cubed. So all I have to do is put it in and 
then I'd hope something happens. And something does happen. Delta F is actually 8a squared plus 4ac minus b squared, all squared, times 4a squared minus 4ac plus c squared plus 4b squared. Well, that's a big problem, right? How is the discriminant going to be square free when it's always divisible by this thing? Well, this thing better be 1 or negative 1 in order to have any sh chance at all of being square free. But it turns out if you set this equal to plus minus 1 and you just solve, right, because you can isolate for the C, yeah? You just do it and you put it back in in that form, you realize that you just always, it just always splits. <laughs> now, it's always reducible, so you never want to count that. And yeah, so their methodology fails spectacularly in the very first step because the discriminant is never square free. So <clears throat> we didn't give up, right? So this is a joint project with uh, Dr. Cindy Tang, just graduated. And we didn't give up, right? We, we wanted to count the so-called fake PGL2Q orbit still, even though we, did, we didn't have the square free discriminant trick. And that, after some work, it, it, it does work out, okay? Like, it, it, you do get enough survivors to say something. But what fails spectacularly is that you do not have any everywhere locally soluble orbits, really. It's almost none. It's 0%. <laughs> okay? So how does that work? So let's just call this Q1 squared Q2, right? So let's discuss what everywhere locally soluble means. <clears throat> okay, so for a field K, so K is a field, and F is binary quartic form with coefficients in K. So F is K soluble if y squared equals f of uv has a solution other than 0, 0, 0. Because obviously 0, 0, 0 is going to solve it, right? Because f is homogeneous. So it will vanish at 0, 0. So, and it's uh, f is P soluble if it's QP soluble. Okay, so that's just what, what it means. F is ELS if it's P soluble for all primes P and it's are soluble. Okay, so these are all the local fields of R. Or sorry, all the local fields of Q, right? That's why it's called ELS. So let's just focus on the P soluble part. R soluble is very easy to control, right? As long as F is not negative definite, it's going to be R soluble. So it's fine. So what if, how, how do we control it's P soluble? So first of all, if it's P soluble, it's got to be FP soluble, right? It's got to have a solution mod P. And not only does it need to have a solution mod P, you have to be able to lift that solution up to QP. That means you have to do Hensel's lemma. Okay, well, that means the criterion to use Hensel's lemma has to be valid. That means that your original point has to be a non-singular point on this curve. Where did I write it? Yeah, so this defines a curve, right? Your FP point better be a smooth point on the curve so you can lift it up to QP. So here, let's recap, okay? In order to be P-soluble, you have to have a point on the curve, and that point on the curve has to be a smooth point. So what if, would it not be unfortunate if you just don't have you just have no chance of having a point on the curve. 
So I claim that if P is an odd prime, such that Q1, right, Q1 is basically this thing, vanishes mod P, then you're screwed, unless something really good happens. So Q1 of ABC congruent to zero mod P is equivalent to, uh, and, and we said that P was an odd prime, okay? It's funny how, how often you have to make that distinction. So, all right, and, and we're gonna assume that P doesn't divide A. Let's just, yeah, let's ignore all the dumb cases. So this is eight A squared plus four AC minus B squared is congruent to zero mod P. So you can isolate from the C, and we assume that P is co-prime to A and it's odd, so it's co-prime to four. So C is congruent to four A inverse times b squared minus 8a squared mod p. Okay? So you plug that in back into here, mod p, right? The defining form. So this implies that f of xy is congruent to 4a inverse Two a x squared plus b x y minus two a y squared squared mod p. Just a direct calculation, and you factor it. Now this is bad, right? Because this thing, the one thing that can actually change is always a square, and you want this to be equal to a square mod p. Well, this thing is already a square. The four is going to be a square. Its inverse will also be a square, right? So the only thing that could, you know, the thing you need to control is the A. If A is not a quadratic residue mod P, then you're screwed, right? Like, you just can't do it. Like, this will never be a square. Unless this thing actually vanishes, right? Like, unless you're talking about a root of this quadratic form. So if the root of the quadratic form it turns out that it corresponds to a singular point, so you can't lift that. So if this is a, not a quadratic residue, you're just done. It will, not, it will fail to be soluble at P. It will even fail to be soluble at FP, much less QP, so you're just done. So now you can ask, okay, what are the chances, yeah, what are the chances that A is gonna be congruent to zero mod P? Well, the, the, the probability is 50%, right? Because half the residues are quadratic residues and the other half are non-residues. So for every prime factor of Q1, you have a 50% chance of being soluble. Okay, and as ABC get large and Q1, you know, the value of Q1 gets large, the number of prime factors increases on average. So you're flipping the coin more and more times, so the probability goes to zero. So yeah, this is a dramatic difference. So, in the last bit of time, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, I remember it was in work that, that, that I talked to Mondro about this. Oh, yeah, because he clarified to me, yes, all I meant was you do the square free discriminant argument, right? You, you count the GL2Z orbits, you sieve, you do a square free sieve on the discriminant, you count what's left, and those are the ones that you want. I'm like, oh, but they're never square free. And he didn't believe me, so I kind of just, of course, I didn't, I, I didn't have anything on hand, right, to show him, so I just kind of cobbled together, you know, I tried to explain that there's a fixed squared factor and things like that, and I think he was, he believed me. But yeah, this is something he genuinely didn't know, and he got the Fields Medal for this stuff. So, uh, so that, that was pretty cool. And then when I talked talk, talk to him about this ELS issue, Samin was actually right there, right? We, we, I talked, that was, that was when I told him in Toronto. I told him, yeah, like uh, it's actually 0% is ELS. And then he was like, oh, well that, that's disappointing. So yeah, this is a pretty ridiculous thing. So I don't know what to even do for, like um, it's, it's, to me, it's just a wildly open question. What is the, the two Selmer behavior for elliptic curves of rational two torsion? Like, I can't even tell you if the average two Selmer rank is bigger or smaller 
than the global average, of, which is three in that case. So on the one hand, you get so, many more, so much more GL2Z classes than you have elliptic curves. But you, you, you lose almost all of them when you sift down to ELS orbits that the, the glut that you have in the beginning, does that, do you just lose exactly that amount when you sift down and you end up with three? Or do you end up with just a little bit more so it goes to infinity? Or you, you, or you get a lot less and it just goes to zero or something like that. So I have no idea what, uh, okay, it can't go to zero. The, the, the lower bound is one. So one is the absolute minimum it can possibly be. That means you have no non-trivial two summer elements, basically. The only ones you have are the dumb ones that correspond to reducible forms. So yeah, we decided that we're not gonna try to count two summer elements anymore. We're gonna stick with the SL2Z classes. And even then, then there's some really ridiculous stuff that happens. But yeah, I thought it was a pretty neat story. So I, we should write this paper up soon, I hope. Yeah. That, that's, yeah, I guess we'll finish a little early, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <clears throat> Yeah. So uh, when you when you wrote down was it the cubic covariant or what is what was the name of it? Uh, uh, cubic resolvent. Cubic resolvent. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, so when you wrote down the cubic resolvent, you assume that one of the roots is rational, and then you have something else, right? So you have this. Uh, so fa suppose that the, the 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 root of this resolvent is rational. There's only one rational root, right? So you stick you stuck with this quadratic thing. Right? Okay, so that, the construction of quadratic has nothing to do with the rationality root. It always works. No, 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 I understand that. What I'm, what I'm, tell, what, what I'm telling you, what I'm, asking, what I'm asking is this, right? Using this root, right, you're constructing, you're constructing an automorphism. You're producing an actual yes. automorphism. Yes, right? yes. But also there's this quadratic thing over there, right, which is, which is I mean, yes, it's not, you can ask, it's not, it doesn't split over Q, but it splits over some, or it represents some root quadratic, right? So I'm wondering, I'm wondering about, like, I mean, it, it, does this also produce a non-trivial automorph? This also produces a non-trivial automorphism in over a quadratic ring. Is that correct or not? Some automorphism of f over q root d. Is that correct? And if so, like, I mean, how can you, can you use this in for the what? Like, I mean, what is the meaning of the uh, non-trivial automorphism over some quadratic field rather than just like non-trivial quadratic field? Rather? Like so I actually don't think you can get, um, okay, well, let's see. I, I think these things cannot actually live in a proper quadratic field. What it does is that if it lives in a quadratic field and nothing bigger, it's actually just Q. Yeah, so it could live in a proper cubic field and could live in a proper quartic field, but not a proper quadratic field. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. But you can, but basically you can produce an actual automorphism in some stuff. No, the automorphism is over GL2C, like this construction always, if you, if you just forget that beta has anything to do with the rational numbers, you just, in fact, don't even think about F as having integer coefficients. Okay, whatever coefficients you want, that construction always works and it always gives you automorphisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a purely geometric object. Geometry doesn't care about Q. All right. So looking at resolvents, for cortex, yes, but it only works once. The frustrating thing about this entire subject is everything works exactly once. You found something super nice, and this is obviously a right thing to look at because it does everything that you want, and then you try to replicate it in degree five, and then just, nope, nothing works. Yeah. So every degree has its own universe. Like, it's, it's, it is its own distinct universe. It does not generalize just because you went from four to five. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? All right. Thanks, Stanley.